1760, when he traveled from Henrico County to Williamsburg to begin his studies at William and Mary, Thomas Jefferson could already read Latin and Greek, and he read the classics regularly throughout his life. Although this man was remarkable and fascinating in countless ways, this was not one of them. <laughs> this was routine. It was assumed that this was simply part of the curriculum in 18th century, 18th century colonial America. And it continued to be for some time. The 19th century, however, saw some fundamental changes in the academy. Even before the Transformative Moral Act of 1862, colleges began to debate the relevance of the classics, or at least the exclusive purchase of the classics, uh, on their curriculum. In the 1820s, Lafayette College had a really a great debate about whether Latin and Greek should form the core of their curriculum. Uh, ultimately, it won out. They continued, but not before one derisive critic said that the classics contributed no more to scientific knowledge than the croaking of frogs. Um, I wanted to think when I read this that this was a erudite allusion to Aristophanes, uh, <laughs> but I don't think I really can believe that. Now, in that same decade, there was a vigorous and highly influential report by Yale, the Yale 1828 report that said, classics uber Alice, or something like that. And that really had a huge influence for the rest of the 19th century. Um, but over that same time, little by little, classics plays a smaller role. And when you get to the 20th century, I would argue that the changes simply accelerate. Let me just look at a few facts, looking at 1900 and roughly 2000. In 1900, 3% of Americans had any post-secondary education. 100 years later, it's 60% or more. Not that everybody finishes their degree, which is a big issue these days, but from 3% to over 60 in a 100-year period. That's percentage. We're not talking about the gross number, which of course is much greater. In 1900, much of what is taught under the aegis of the social sciences today either didn't exist or was not taught in the academy. And of course, there are many fields that simply did not exist, period. Engineering, genetics. Remember, DNA is not you know, discovered until 1953. Also take a quick look at some of the demographic changes uh, in that period. Um, look who goes to college today. Uh, whether we're talking about underrepresented minorities uh, or the percentage of women, a huge change from 100 years ago. We live in this wonderfully crazy uh, digital age uh, which seems to devalue memorization, historical context. We live in the eternal present. And there are very different expectations, although I want to get back to this from a somewhat different angle in a minute. There is a progressively instrumentalist view of education. There is, I'm embarrassed to say, in my home state now, a law that is about to pass, they will vote on it tomorrow, which is about higher education, the economy, and it, is, it says in the legislation, and this bill can be called Top Jobs 21, okay? top jobs for the 21st century, and it's again an entirely an instrumentalist view of why higher education is important. It does mean that we're not getting budget cuts this year, so we have something to be grateful for. Um, we also know in recent years examples of classics departments being merged, reduced, eliminated, uh, not here uh, at the University of Miami. Uh, and obviously SUNY Albany has gotten a huge amount of attention over the last six months in response to their actions on the humanities. I'd like to say that that's a unique case, that that's just an outlier. Unfortunately, it's not. So what are the challenges that we face? And what are some of our biggest advantages? Let's start with the challenges. A lot of what we do isn't that easy. Learning Greek and Latin requires a capacity for hard work and patient understanding. My professor in college said we had to learn to be creatively bored when we learned all those paradigms. <laughs> and we live in an age of immediate gratifications. Okay? If I can't know it now, the heck with it. Um, and most of our students come to Greek and Latin at an age which is probably less conducive to absorbing paradigms than it would have been a generation or two ago. Second, knowledge, or maybe better put, information proliferates and the pace at which it proliferates simply accelerates. Areas of inquiry, good ones, exciting ones, valuable ones, develop and demand a place at the table. 
We face, in other words, more competition for a slice of the curricular pie. In the post-war, post-World War II period, we saw enormous growth in universities, fueled more than anything else by the, by the GI Bill. And it was much easier in that period of agglomeration simply to add, oh, we'll do this, we'll take on that, we'll also give degrees in this. But that period of enormous growth, I don't think is going to be repeated anytime soon. We also, in some ways, seem to many less relevant. Whether we're too old, too white, too male, we just don't seem as important as we once did. What are the careers for these classicists? What will they contribute to the Commonwealth? I actually think there may be a silver lining to this particular cloud of apparent irrelevance, and I'll get back to that, I hope, in a couple of minutes. Finally, there are administrators, that class to which, yes, I currently belong. And to that group, classics often seems like an easy target. Relatively small on most campuses, no strong advocacy group, with all due respect to the APA, uh, no clear societal demand. There may be some anti-elitist sentiment involved as well, though I suspect that's actually relatively small. To put this all in a somewhat wider context, society now expects much more from higher education in terms of outcomes and accountability. This is seen in myriad ways. Look at the Spellings Commission report of 2006, the increased demands from our regional accrediting bodies, which every few years come up with something else they, they want us to do, the hearings in Congress and state legislature about access, affordability, student debt, and the seemingly never-ending spate of articles and books that anecdotally say what's wrong with us. Right? Faculty are, are, are lazy, students don't want to study, we just keep raising up the cost of higher education. I'm very confident, however, about the future of classics in particular and of the humanities in general. Let me focus on the former and give you some sense of what I think we have going for us. First, we work in a field of tremendous power and creativity. We teach authors like Virgil and Homer, Tacitus and Thucydides, Propertius and Sappho. Democracy, at least how we think about democracy uh, in the West, begins in Athens. The Greco-Roman world was a wonderful crucible of important debates about freedom, nationalism, justice, and a fertile incubator for fields such as mathematics and law, philosophy and medicine. Our basic materials are of the highest quality and profound interest. Our field is captivating. Second, we obviously occupy a particularly privileged position in the history of the West. Not only is the, our material intrinsically interesting, but it also has a role in the Renaissance, in, well, the medieval period, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and beyond. I'm sometimes amused in different ways about our friends in the Tea Party. Uh, I, has, I suspect they have little idea that those founding fathers, with all that original intent, were imbued directly and indirectly with the thinking of classical antiquity. Third, and some people will be surprised to hear this, I think we've been remarkably nimble over the years. The ideal of Alterturmswissenschaft reflects a holistic approach to Greco-Roman culture. And this breadth of study has served us well, not only intellectually, but strategically, as it has been easier for us to expand what we include in our curriculum. In the more recent decades, the field has responded